hands together for our worship.
The truth is, you've been set up by an entrepreneur. He hopes you are feeling down when you come. He hopes that you're down on your luck, so to speak, that the blessings aren't quite flowing for you. But he does hope that you got a little change in your pocket. In trade, he gives you nothing for your money. Anywhere in the world, this is considered stealing or robbery. But not by the wishing well or the power. The truth is, is that, well, <coughs> he's hoping that you have a little bit of heartache. He's hoping that you have an issue. You may say, Brother Josh, uh, if I go to that well, it does give me something. It gives me hope. Well, I got a word for you, and it's not hope, it's baloney. You're not getting nothing but a big thing of baloney. I hope you like baloney. If you do like baloney, you just keep throwing them coins in there. Uh, but the pastor will tell you not to, not to, so you better quit. <laughs> Stop it. Be good stewards. Keep your change. The truth is, there is only one well that provides true hope. Are you there? Only one well. That well is Jesus, the Son of God. <clears throat> if you're looking for hope, let me introduce you to Jesus. Now, I always like to do this for some reason. You know, it, maybe there's a case that there's somebody in here that doesn't really know Jesus and his attributes or what he does or what he has done. But let me go, on, go ahead and do this for you. If you're looking for hope, let me introduce you to Jesus. He came to the world and lived without sin. He gave his life to you when he was crucified on a tree that we call a cross. He was dead and buried. Yet he rose the third day after his death. Yes. How who's done that? Come on. He was full of life and he was possessing, like we heard last night, all power over death, hell, and the grave. Yes. He gave his life for you to make a way for you to come to God. Yes. Now that's the kind of Jesus we serve. Amen. Amen. I don't know what you came expecting here today, but I hope that you came expecting to come to the well and be filled. Amen. I entitled this sermon, Come to the Well. We're going to be looking at John chapter 4, 7, and 9 now. If you want to keep up, that's fine. I have these notes. My wife says we're not going to keep using our printer ink. We'll just Bring some off in the church. That's what we pay tithes for. If you need some notes, you just holler at me. Because if I ever get up here and I don't tell you something in Scripture, I want to know what you think. I want to know what you think, and I want to know that, that I can give you Scripture to back it up. Now, you might not agree with me, but I'm going to tell you this much now. I'm not going to argue, doctor. I'm not going to argue. I had enough of that earlier in my life, and it didn't lead to nothing but heartache. But I'm not going to argue with you just take my notes and you change your mind. <laughs> Boy, thank you, Jesus, for that. All right, we're looking at John 4, 7 through 9. It says, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me the drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For these Jew, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Let me tell you something. Jesus came to break down tradition. Okay? He didn't he come to fulfill what the prophets had said, and he did that. He come to fulfill, but he come to break down the walls of tradition. This is one of the major problems in religion today. Tradition. We get so set in things that have been there, have been in place year after year. Are you there? I got one over here. Somebody's there. You tired of tradition? Who said that? 
tired of tradition. Amen. The rest of y'all like tradition? Let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with tradition if it's the right kind of tradition. If things have been set in the place a long time ago that were right. But let me tell you, that's not always the case. Some of the times we get into gimmicks. Sometimes we get into, oh, I got to feel this way. I got to feel that way. I, I feel like I have to do three steps, two jumps, and a hop before the Holy Ghost gets on. Well, that's not true. And if you think like that, you're thinking the most of You say, now, Brother Josh, are you saying that I'm not supposed to get emotional? No, I'm not saying you're not supposed to get emotional. If the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you will get emotional. I'm just sick of the people that get emotional to get the Holy Ghost. That's not true. That's not true. You do not have to be emotional before the Holy Ghost comes. You just have to have your heart right. You just have to be ready to accept the Him. But I am following the Lord. And the Lord. 
Force is directing me and going where I'm going, but I can get what I would call too radical as in that I am just, I just keep going in this direction, but I never seek after the will of the Lord. I get so blindsided about going this direction that I can't hear what the Lord is saying. He might have told me this way back when, but I get so blinded that I'm just so blind. I'm not telling you not to be focused. Now listen to me now. I'm not telling you not to be focused, but we run in from being spiritual where we could hear God at one time to run into being religious. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And we think that we have to be so ready, so focused that we can't see that this brother and sister is hurting. We can't see that that sister or brother needs something. We can't see that. We are so focused on going this direction where Josh Parker is going that we don't care about where Sister uh, Marilyn is going. We don't care about Brother Prentice. And we are all part of a body and we all got to go in the same direction. I can't leave them back there, which I, you know, I'm behind y'all really. You know, I'm trying to catch up with you. You know what I'm saying. We can't, we can't be so focused on ourselves that we leave others behind. The signs of a true leader is a person that doesn't hold others down but brings them up with them. Now listen, now you get that now. Sign of a true leader doesn't hold people down to exalt them up to a higher position. A true leader brings people up with them. If you're not, if you're not under a true leader that is bringing you down, that's not holding his leg or her leg on you, then you're under a good leader that will bring that is bringing you up. God's trying to equip you. He's not trying to uh, hold you down. He's not trying to bound you. And if you're under a preacher that's trying to bound you, stay, keep you down, make sure you're right now. Make sure you're right. Make sure you're not in the world or in the flesh. Make sure you're right. You need to get under some right teaching. John 14 and 12. Like I said, let God move. You move and God moves. John 14 and 12 says, Jesus answered and said unto her, and thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me the drink thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou this living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Let's look at verse 10. It says, Jesus said in a matter of words, Woman, you don't know what you're talking, who you're talking to. In a matter of words is what Jesus said. You don't know who you're talking to. If you knew the gift of God and who you were talking to, you would have asked me for living water. Boy, uh -huh. I like his scripture. Jesus is saying, if you could only see me for who I am. And what I can do for you. Jesus is saying to us today, if you can just see me for who I am truly, and I, I can begin to work things out in your life. We have to be able to recognize who Jesus is in our life. Who he truly is. What he's willing to do and what he's willing not to do. God's not willing to compromise things for you. He's not going to compromise. Well, God, if you can just do this for me so I can do this, you know, He's not going to compromise. But He will pour into you exactly what you need. Like I said the other night, who He calls, He doesn't call the equip. He equips who He calls. He equips who He calls. Uh, what is it that you need today? Jesus has got your healing. Are you there? Jesus has got your healing. Jesus has got your security. And He's got your peace of mind. Anybody lost some peace of mind lately? Anybody lost that? You've lost your peace of mind. You've lost your security. You've lost your healing. He will be your lawyer. Now we, we kind of uh, say... Uh, you know, lawyers are automatically crooked. Well, that's not necessarily true. You can be a lawyer and not 
might be crooked. I don't know how. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say with you, he'll be your lawyer. He will make a way for you when there's not a way present. I heard Ray Comfort say this. I like the way he tells his story. We as a group of people, we're in the courtroom and we are being brought up on charges for, for everything that we've done wrong in this life. At the end of the trial, we are declared guilty before all. Then with the power of God, the doors of the courtroom burst into pieces and the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ the Mighty, enters and says, I have paid the price. I have paid the price. Let them go free. The truth is, that is more reality than what we really see. The truth is, is that we all had a death sentence. We all were found guilty at the stage where we were born. We were all found guilty. But Jesus made a way for us. Now, if I was to come in and uh, let's say that uh, Sister Wendy had committed at least a million dollars worth of fines. Now that's a lot of fishing illegally. <laughs> now if Sister Wendy has got racked up over a million dollars in fines, I'm sure they're going to put her into jail. I don't know how that works, but I'm sure she's going to jail. I can write PJ. She's going to jail. Like PJ was like, she's going to jail.
These chains can be broken off of your life. I'm talking about freedom. I'm talking about everlasting water. I'm talking about living water. The Bible says, He who the Son sets free is free in Indeed. There it is. There's another one back there. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. That means that you don't have to carry around that baggage anymore. That the blood of Jesus was sufficient enough for you and you and you and you and all y'all over there and even you back there, Brother Willie. God's blood is sufficient for you. Amen. And it's definitely sufficient for myself. Isaiah 53. The Samaritan woman, she asked, she said, uh, she said, uh, asked Jesus question, says, uh, about his ability to draw from the well. She questions, is he greater than their father Jacob in verses 11 and 12? Let me tell you the truth today. Jesus doesn't have to draw power from any source. He is power. He is power. He doesn't have to draw it from anywhere. He could have created a well with his own words. He could have had a cold glass of iced tea just from a mention of his word. The Samaritan woman did not realize who she, who she was talking to because of Isaiah 53 and 2. I'm going to read that for you. We're going to look at Isaiah 53. If y'all want to go there, I'm going to read it to you. You don't have to go there, but if you want to check me, go and check it. For Isaiah 53, 2, it says, this is the reason why she didn't recognize it. He said, For he shall grow up before them as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. You see, his power and his beauty was hidden from her eyes. You see, if Jesus would have come like they picture him on TV, if Jesus would have come like they put him on Google, you know, people would have naturally been drawn to him. But the Bible says opposite. There was no form of comeliness that you could look at and say, that is a good looking man right there. That's a good, you know, that's not the way it was. That's not the way it was. The Bible says he was as a root out of dry ground. There was nothing that you would just say, whoo. You know, you wouldn't be attracted to him like, like people are to me. You know, Lord forgive me. <laughs> Ellen knows what I'm talking about. Ellen. The rest of Isaiah 53 says he was despised and rejected of men. Yes. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. Yes. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Yes. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Yes. All we like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Amen. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked. And with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put on him grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall be.
shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the tra travail of his soul and shall be satisfied, but his knowledge shall be righteous. His knowledge shall, be, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Now I'm going to stop now. Jesus said it. They said what the Lord's saying here is that He's going to divide His portion with the strong. Who is the strong? The Lord talking about us. But why would He call us the strong? And sometimes we feel so weak. But He said that Jesus, we're co-heirs with Christ. He's going to divide His full with us because He had poured out His soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. My question for you today is how awesome is Jesus? How amazing is Jesus? He healed us from sicknesses by the stripes of his back. I don't think as Christians we really understand all that, we, what, that he went through. I think we're only seeing the surface. Well, we can see that. When I say we're only seeing the surface, we've seen the physical brutality that happened to Jesus Christ. We've seen the physical laceration. I mean, we can somewhat picture through the Bible his physical trauma. But we can't picture the mental. What he went through. The Word might tell us a little bit, might hint into it. But at the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweat drops of blood. Now think about that for a moment. What kind of, what is that? How, how stressed or how, how tormented in a way was Jesus to sweat drops of blood? Now we've been through hard times in our lives. Does anybody sweat drops of blood in here? Let me know. Anybody? So I would, I would dare to say that we can compile all your griefs and all your sorrows. We can compile those and put them on one person and they wouldn't drop blood. No, we would have to take generation and generation and generation and generation of billions of people and we'd have to take their griefs and put them on a single person. We would have to take the, the sum of all problems, the sum of all things and put them on one person to get blood drops from them. Let me tell you, when Jesus was in Gethsemane, He asked the Lord. He asked the Lord, but He was thinking about you. He wanted the cup to pass from Him, but He said, Lord, Your will be done. God is not willing. Jesus was not willing to go from obedience to disobedience to save His name. And I know I do it in a heartbeat. What does it say about me? What does that say? I'm not saying I'm not saying that I would, you know, if my wife told me to do something to save my neck, I ain't gonna do it if it's gonna save my neck. Am I saying that I'm gonna go into disobedience from God? No, it's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that when your time comes, and it will. If the Lord tarries, things ain't going to get better. Hey, I'm, you want me to lie to you and tell you things are going to be rosy? They're not. Right. You read Revelation. Things are going to get rough. If the Lord tarries and we have to stay here, we're going to have to fight. Yeah. We're going to have to make stands. And some of us are not going to. You're going to go to heaven. But things here on earth ain't going to necessarily be great. But we know that the Lord will always be with us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. But we're going to have to go with Him all the way to the end. We're going to have to endure. We're going to have to overcome according to Revelation. Lord, ain't going to let me get off that. Bless the Lord. It's not a walk in the park. But it is great. Yes, it is. It's 
Say, if there was anybody famous that you wanted to talk to, it is nothing to talk to the king. Say, if there's somebody you always wanted to meet, you know, I know Brother Bobby loves Jerry Lawler. <laughs> I don't necessarily know that, but just to make a statement, he'd do anything to do to meet Jerry Lawler. <laughs> but that is nothing to the king of glory. It's nothing to the king of glory. It is not going to be a bed of roses. It's not necessarily going to be a walk in the park. But let me tell you, it's going to be an awesome walk. It's going to be an awesome walk. And if you'll just stay on that path, things are going to be awesome. They're going to be great. They're going to be wonderful. There's going to be times of pain, but you're going to endure. You're going to overcome. And one day, hallelujah. One day, that eastern sky is going to split and we're going to see Him coming in the sky. Amen. Amen. Woo! Bless the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. And he's going to say, come on up here, child. Come on up here. Come on up here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. There's nothing down here that I'm going to think about. Uh -huh. But when I see Him high and lifted up, Where it's going to be. Oh, Lord. Think about that. Yes, thank you. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. You don't want to miss it. I know I get to meddle sometimes when I pray you get to laugh and stuff, but you don't want to miss it. Could I ever emphasize to you that how important heaven is, it is the most important of it. decision you'll ever make in your life. Amen. More than your job, more than pulling the plug on your child, more than saying goodbye to your mom or dad. You'll never make a more important decision.
The water springing up is a type and a shadow of the Holy Ghost and His ability to comfort you in your time of need. Are you in a dry place today? Are you in a dry place? I will tell you to stir up the gift that is inside of you. When was the last time you spoke in your heavenly language? Now, Brother Josh, you're getting into my business. I'm not telling you to tell. When is the last time you spoke in your heavenly language? I believe, and the Lord wouldn't have told me this. He wouldn't have spoke this to me if I didn't believe that it was something was going to happen. I believe that we're facing to experience a shift. Please stand to your feet. James 4 and 8 says, Draw nigh unto God, and He will draw nigh unto you. <laughs> Let's take a little bit of time to begin to stir that gift that is inside of us. If you don't know how to speak in tongues, or you are not, you haven't been filled with the Holy Ghost to speak in tongues, you pray. And pray like your life depended on it. If you've been blessed with the gift of speaking in tongues, I ask you now, listen to me, I ask you now to go into your heavenly language and seek after the Lord. Now, Father God, we ask you to just do a mighty move, Lord. Paul, we ask that a ship would come, Lord, and that we just seek after you, praise as you, Lord. Lord, you just have your way, Lord. I ask you that the ship would come, Lord, and that we would seek after you, Lord, that you would just bless, Lord, and that you Spirit would come in, Lord. I ask you that the noise would come, Lord, and that it would flow. Shanda katada di, shanda di, shanda di. Lord, shanda katada di, shanda di, shanda di, shanda di. Lord, I ask that the morning, that the shift that you have shown me, Lord, that it would come, Lord. Lord, that these people would experience your move, Lord, and that we would take time with you, and that we would just try to understand. Lord, that we're trying to build ourselves, we're trying to Lord, I ask you to do it, Lord. I ask you to do it, Lord. Just move and move on us. Lord, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I ask you to stand and be a reverence to the Lord. You can sit back down for a second. First Corinthians 14 and 4 says, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesied edifieth the church. Now that would, you would think by just looking at that at face value that it would seem selfish, but it's not. The word edify means to build a house or wreck a building. It means to build. Build up from the foundation. It means to restore by building, to rebuild and repair. Spiritual gifts are very important to us and we need to be seeking after the spiritual gifts. Now I'm not telling you to seek after the spiritual gifts more than you seek after God. You understand what I'm saying? That's again what I was talking about, the momentum. You get so focused on seeking the spiritual gifts that you ain't know nothing about God. That's the momentum that the devil will use you. You got to get that spiritual gift, brothers, so you get farther away from God. Listen to me. You need to seek after God and the spiritual gifts that He's going to impart for you. Some of us, including myself, need to begin to edify ourselves every day. We need to speak in tongues. We need to spend the time in edifying ourselves. We need to be built up for what the day is going to bring. We need to build ourselves with the gift that God has given us. Now, many of you have been blessed with many gifts. You have many gifts. Don't hide that in the ground. Use that for the glory of God. We must use our heavenly language as a weapon that it is. We have to use it to restore, to rebuild, to repair ourselves through the power of God. John 4, 16-18. I'll say this in closing. Jesus said, saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast now hast is not thy husband, and that thou 
sayest, in that saidest thou truly. Now why did Jesus tell the woman to go retrieve her husband if he knew that she didn't have one? Or that she had had five prior and the one that was with her wasn't. Now why would he say it? Jesus knows how to get to the root of the problem. Now I'm not judging this woman, but her record's in the Bible for a reason. God doesn't redundantly put things in the Word. He just doesn't have things in there for any particular reason. She had been married five times, and she was with a man that wasn't her husband at the time. Now, whether she was living with him, I don't know the situation, because I went back there, okay? I'm not going to speculate on the situation. But her record stands to prove that Jesus knew her situation. Jesus knows how to get to the root of our problems. God's dealing with you about something. Don't you just write that off. He's telling you that you need to get something out of your life that might not be sin to me, Brother Bobby, but might be sin to you, and vice versa. Because sometimes we make up idols. Yeah. Oh, I love this box of tissue. <laughs> Look at my box of tissue. It's mine. set this up here up high because it's, it's just it's set a little bit higher because this is my box of tissue. <laughs> I ain't got to go no further. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. We spend, we spend so much time with things that they become our God. We serve them because we invest so much time into them. We become servants of that. Look, I'm not telling you to go empty your house of every little thing that you enjoy to do. I'm not saying that you crocheting is your God. I'm not saying that. But I am saying this. Anything that comes between you and God has become your God. What will you do with Jesus? Go ahead and stand.